survive the dangerous new world. A team of heroes get summoned to a different world where they meet a princess who evaluates their abilities. Each hero possesses unique talents like a holy sword technique and versatile magic. Among them, Mokota stands out when his skill is assessed. He has an unusual skill, something like online groceries. This revelation surprises Mokota, who fears his skill might be worthless. He questions whether he possesses any other abilities but is disheartened to learn that this is his only unique skill. Mokota can't help but wonder why the others receive such overpowering skills while he receives something seemingly ordinary. Nonetheless, they are summoned by the king, who explains that their kingdom is under attack by the demon king. The three heroes eagerly offer their assistance, but Mokota feels he isn't suited for heroism. He simply wishes for a peaceful life. So he decides to leave and is even given 20 gold coins by the townsfolk. His peculiar attire draws attention, so he has to buy new clothes. As he explores the world, he eventually finds lodging and is relieved to have chosen not to be a hero. The luxurious lifestyle of the kingdom's residents makes him suspicious, and he plans to depart as soon as possible. Upon inspecting his skills, Mokota discovers an item storage skill and an appraisal skill. He attempts to use his online grocery skill, but it doesn't respond. Confused, he accidentally taps on it, revealing an online shop interface. Mokota decides to order water and food, but is surprised when it asks for payment. He learns that he can deposit his coins into the screen, and the items arrive instantly, and so he realizes the true value of his skill. He also learns that a gold coin is worth around 100 iron coins, which means the 20 gold coins he received can support a family for three months. The following day, Mokota finds a way out of the kingdom with the help of a traveler. During their conversation, he discovers that his item storage skill is exceptionally rare, with only one in a thousand people possessing it. This news intrigues him, and he decides not to tell anyone about it. Curiosity leads him to inquire about the appraisal skill, and the traveler reveals that it is even rarer, typically belonging to heroes summoned from other worlds. Mokota can't help but feel nervous about his newfound abilities and decides to keep them a secret from everyone. The man then inquires about Mokauta's destination, to which he replies that he's trying to reach the next kingdom. The man advises him to leave because the kingdom is in trouble, with rumors of the borders closing soon. Mokauta is surprised, and as a result, their carriage ends up halted at a local tavern. Mokauta learns that the carriage services are suspended to prevent people from fleeing the kingdom, as it would weaken the kingdom's army. The men suggest they leave while they still can, but Mokuta worries about encountering monsters, so he goes to the Adventurer's Guild to request an escort. The guild clerk explains that since he's on foot, it takes several days, costing eight gold coins. Mukata is shocked by the price but has no other choice, so he agrees. The clerk calls over an adventurer named Werner, a C-ranked adventurer. They negotiate the mission and Mokuta offers to provide them with food during the journey. They come to an agreement and plan to depart the next day. Warner introduces the rest of his party, Vincent, the swordsman, Rita, the scout, Raymond, the mage, and Franca, the healer. On their way, they stop for a break. Mokata prepares food, surprising Vincent with his storage skill and impressing Rita with his magic stove. In a flashback, Mokata recalls a shopkeeper trying to sell him a magic stove for 50 gold coins, but he manages to find a cheaper one online. He makes soup and sandwiches, which the party finds delicious. They continue their journey but are attacked by monsters. Werner and Vincent swiftly defeat them, leaving Mokota amazed. As they heal up, Rita reports a red boar ahead. They discuss how to handle it, but the boar suddenly appears, shocking Mokota with its sides. Werner advises him to take cover, and they engage in battle. They defeat the boar, skin it for its hide and horns, but it's too much to carry. So, Mokota suggests storing the meat in his storage, and so they do. Moments later, they stop for dinner, eagerly anticipating his food. They gather around to eat, but Mokota gets embarrassed, secretly wanting for them to look away so he can use his special skill. He decides to make a tasty stew, blending bacon, cabbage, potatoes, and sausages. Passing out bowls to everyone, Mokota worries if they'll enjoy it, but they all love it and keep asking for more. Surprisingly, they usually eat jerky and hard bread when traveling. Rita even feels healthier after the meal, leaving Mokota puzzled. When he uses his appraisal skill, he discovers Rita has boosted stats, and the food grants a buff. Worried about the secret, he keeps it to himself. During their journey, they camp in a forest a few days away from the next kingdom. Mokauta decides to cook some boar meat. He slices it up and uses a special sauce from his shop. The aroma attracts a lurking beast. When Mokauta finishes, they are all amazed by the taste, praising his cooking skills. Suddenly, a Fenrir emerges behind him, and they fear it. It demands some meat, so Mokota serves it on a plate. 
The Fenrir craves more, and Lokota keeps cooking, making a huge plate. The Fenrir devours it, and Lokota prepares more. This continues until Fenrir is satisfied, impressed, it wants to form a familiar contract. Mokauta is hesitant, but Fenrir's intense stare and his friend's encouragement convince him. They form the contract, and Fenrir demands three meals a day, leaving Mokota shocked at his new responsibility. The Fenrir now asks Mokauta to give it a name, and Mokota struggles to come up with one. He suggests common dog names, but the Fenrir isn't impressed. After some thought, Mokota suggests Fell, which the beast agrees to. As they continue their journey, they notice that people are avoiding them, likely due to a legend about a destructive Fenrir. This situation worries the party, especially Warner, who is concerned about crossing the border. Ritha explains the legend, increasing Mokauta's anxiety. However, Fell assures Mokauta that he will protect the group. During a lunch break, Mokota realizes they've run out of meat when Fell requests some. Mokauta suggests that Fell catch his own food, and to everyone's surprise, Fell returns with a valuable rock bird. Upon reaching the border of the Venon Kingdom, they encounter guards on high alert, preparing for potential trouble. Werner steps forward to explain their situation. It's a tense moment, but eventually, the commander agrees to let them pass, mainly because Fel can communicate and promises not to cause trouble. Inside the kingdom, the party members present their guild cards. Unfortunately, Mokauta doesn't have one and must pay an entrance fee. Warner cautions Mokauta that news of his legendary familiar will attract attention, causing Mokauta to rethink his plans. He considers whether to join the Merchant Guild or the Adventurer's Guild. Vincent suggests the possibility of registering for both guilds, and Franca confirms that it's an option. And with these thoughts in mind, they enter the city. A servant quickly welcomes him and invites him to meet the Count, as Mokauta is a legendary beast tamer. Mokauta initially refuses but the man insists on his presence. When Fell approaches and threatens the man who flees in fear, Werner is concerned about making an enemy, but Fell reassures him and Vincent suggests they might need a dragon to challenge Fell since he is so strong. Mokauta is surprised to learn about dragons and Fell agrees, mentioning a past fight with one 400 years ago. Werner gets Mokauta's approval for their job, and Mokuta is surprised by his own ability to write in their language, thinking it's a skill summoned heroes have. The group thanks Mokauta for the delicious food, and they part ways. Mukana heads to the Merchant Guild, where people nervously avoid him. As he enters, everyone's attention turns to him. Mokauta requests to join the guild, and the clerk explains the five merchant levels that determine fees and taxes. She offers him an iron rank and gives him a guild card. Later, Mokauta discovers that beasts can't stay at the inn, but Fel is more interested in dinner than anything else. Mokauta starts cooking meat but suddenly craves rice, so he picks up another stove from his shop. As he cooks, Fel eagerly watches. He finishes the steak with a sauce and Fel finds it delicious. Mokauta gives him another steak and Fel notices a change in flavor. Mokauta reveals he has different sauces and Fel is amazed that the same meat can taste so different. In the end, Fel enjoys the garlic flavor. Mokauta cooks a delicious beef bowl for himself and surprises himself with the taste. As Mokauta prepares goods for sale the next day, he heads back to the merchant guild to sell some of his items. The clerk is shocked when she sees what he has and she rushes off. Mokauta wonders if there's a problem but ends up being invited inside. He meets the guild master, who examines his goods and praises the quality of his salt and pepper, fit for a king. Mokauta claims he acquired them during his travels, and the guild master respects his privacy. Then the guild master offers to buy everything for 14 gold coins, surprising Mokauta as it only cost him 5 copper each. Considering the exchange rate, the guild master assumes he's hesitant and increases the offer to 17 gold coins, which Mokauta accepts. He can't believe how effortlessly he can earn money, relieving his financial worries for some time. His next stop is the Adventurer's Guild, where the ambience is different. Expressing his desire to join, the clerk's disinterest is weird as she hands him a form. Once he completes it, she tosses in his card, indicating his starting rank as G. Puzzled, he inquires about the guild, and the clerk, with a casual tone, explains that adventurers were ranked from G to S, allowing them to undertake missions one level higher than their rank. Importantly, the guild bore no responsibility for injuries or deaths. Mokauta goes to the job board and finds an uncomplicated herb gathering task to start with. The following day, he readies himself for the mission but faces Fel's stern glare, insisting it is breakfast time. After reaching the fields, Fel complains of his hunger due to insufficient ingredients. Fel suggests he goes hunting again, to which Mokauta agrees, despite concerns for his own safety in his absence. Fel reassures him and casting a protected barrier urges Mokauta to have lunch prepared upon his return. 
As Fell dashes off, Mokota sets off on his quest, using his appraisal skill to effortlessly locate the required herbs. Completing the mission with ease, he thinks of the possibility of receiving a greater reward for collecting more than the requested amount. With the mission accomplished, Mokota decides to prepare lunch. Lacking meat, he opts for a cost-effective meal from his shop, spaghetti. As he readies the dish, Fell returns with a rock bird, reminiscing about the teriyaki he had enjoyed previously. He mentions hunting other monsters but being unable to bring them all at once. Mokauta suggests they retrieve them later. Then he completes the spaghetti with the final ingredient, parmesan cheese. Fell finds the dish peculiar and Mokuda explains it is a food from his own world. Upon trying it, Fell is pleasantly surprised despite the limited meat. Mokauta suggests sprinkling the cheese powder, which amazes Fell with its richer flavor. A messy mishap happens as Fell gets sauce all over himself, leading Mokauta to laugh at him. Moments later, we see Mokauta who is suddenly taken aback when he sees the multitude of monsters Fell has hunted, including orcs. He ponders whether everything is edible, but Fell clarifies that orcs are considered delicacies. With the monsters stored away, it is time to return to town. Mokauta heads to the Adventurer's Guild and hands in the collected herbs. The girl is taken aback by the number of herbs Mokauta has and assumes he got lucky, so she pays him nine silver coins for the herbs. Mokauta then inquires about selling monsters, which surprises the girl. He points to Fel to tell her that it is him who hunted them all, and she directs him to the guild butcher. Mokauta presents an orc, causing the butcher to worry about space. They go to the back, and the butcher mentions he had heard rumors about Mokauta in town. Seconds later, Mokauta takes out a mountain of monsters, astonishing the butcher with the quantity and the inclusion of air-ranked monsters. Mokauta requests the butcher to skin all the monsters, mentioning he'd sell all the materials except the meat. With so many monsters, the butcher asked him to return the next day. Mokauta requests one monster to be skinned for dinner, and the man prepares an orc for him. Taking the meat, Mokauta starts cooking dinner, revealing his storage skill that keeps food from spoiling. He coats the orc meat with flour, fries it, and adds some leftover sauce from lunch. Fell enjoys the food, noting that orc meat is more tender than regular boar meat. Mokauta, initially put off by the idea of eating an orc, is pleasantly surprised when he tastes it and learns not to judge things before trying them. The next morning, Mokauta returns to the butchers, where a mountain of meat awaits him. The man pays him 202 gold coins for all the materials, leaving Mokauta shocked by the amount of money. The man teaches him about the value of specific materials, like orcs' private parts for strength and boar tusks for crafting. He also gives Mokauta some demonic stones dropped by A-ranked monsters, containing magical powers. The townspeople have been discussing Mokauta, debating whether Fel is truly a Fanrir or just a great wolf. As Mokauta heads out of town, he decides it is time to leave and tells Fel they shouldn't stay in one place for too long. Fel agrees but mentions he is hungry. They leave town and find a spot to set up camp. While Mokauta prepares dinner, he decides to treat Fel to a feast as he has made a lot of money. He showcases meat from his world to Fel, who seems to drool over the options. Mokauta orders a variety of food and creates a platter with different meats from his world. Fel is amazed by the various textures and flavors, having never tasted such foods before. Mokauta follows up with the main dish, cooking up some Japanese black steak. Though Fel is initially disappointed by its small size, he is instantly impressed when he tastes it. Mokauta explains that it comes from a specially raised cow. After their feast, they continue their journey. Fel, brimming with energy, confidently claims he can defeat even a dragon. This leaves Mokauta feeling anxious, forcing him to use his appraisal skill on Fel. To his astonishment, Mokauta discovers that Fel's stats have received a significant boost from his energy surge. Fired up and ready for action, Fel decides to embark on a hunting expedition. However, Mokauta can't help but worry about being left alone. In response, Fel assures him that he will cast a barrier potent enough to withstand a dragon's breath. With this reassurance, Fel dashes off into the forest, leaving Mokauta behind. Trusting in Fel's barrier, Mokauta prepares his bed and settles in for the night. In the forest, Fel goes on a rampage, swiftly dispatching a rock bird with a single swipe and employing lightning magic to tear apart a massive deer. A formidable Chimera beast comes up, but Fel counters with a devastating lightning attack, causing a massive explosion. The following morning, Mokauta finds himself surrounded by three mountains of monsters, a sight that leaves him utterly astounded. While Fel admits he might go a little overboard, he proudly claims to take down the Chimera with a single attack, something that poses a significant challenge in the past. Seeing the effects of the Japanese black steak, Mokauta has no choice but to remove it from his menu as they pause for lunch. 
Curious about Fel's hunting techniques, Mokawa inquires if Fel uses magic. Fel reveals his proficiency in wind magic, a blessing from the wind goddess. Mokawa loves it when Fel shows him his magic for the first time and wonders if he can marvel at such powers. Fel assures him that it should be possible if he possesses magic power. Mokawa examines his stats and realizes he has the potential. Seeking guidance, he turns to Fel, who simply advises him to concentrate on it. Mokawa tries to cast a fireball by imagining it, but his attempts fail, leading to some embarrassment. Fel then shows how mana flows within his body and coaches him until he successfully shoots a weak fireball. Fel comments on Mokawa's training method, suggesting that he should gain experience from battling monsters. Though hesitant due to the fear of getting hurt, Mokawa's worries annoy Fel, who carries him off to put his words into action. They stumble upon a goblin village and Mokota frets about their numbers. In a bold move, Fel draws the attention of all the goblins with a fierce howl. A chase happens, and Fel informs Mokota that there is no turning back, he has to fight. While Mokota unleashes his fireballs and eventually makes a powerful one, it drains his mana and leaves him exhausted. In his moment of weakness, Fel reappears to bring the fight to a close. When he wakes up, he's deeply shaken by what has happened, but Fel suggests he should show gratitude for aiding him in using magic. Remarkably, he senses that he has advanced in his abilities. Through a thorough check, Mokota discovers that he has acquired the fire magic skill. As a token of appreciation, Fel has brought back the Goblin King, although it's indible. The reason for this unusual gift is that the Goblin King contains a valuable magic stone. Recognizing the potential value of these magic stones, Fel believes he deserves another celebratory meal. His longing for the Japanese steak is brought up in his mind again, but Mokuda declines his request. Mokuda is weakened due to his depleted mana and thinks it is better to purchase ready-made food instead. They get an assortment of sweet bread, but Fel craves meat. Still, he starts eating the sweets and eventually loves it. Despite Mokuda's warnings about the ill effects of excessive sweets like cavities or diabetes, Fel insists he's immune to such ailments due to the wind goddess's blessing, proudly boasting about it. This irks Mokota, who feels it's unfair considering Fel's existing strength. He silently pleads for a similar blessing. Interestingly, it appears the goddess is observing their interaction. Upon arriving at the next town with Phil, a commotion arises. To avoid drawing attention, Mokota swiftly presents his guild card, asserting that Fel is his loyal great wolf companion. Although Phil tries to correct this, Mokota goes along with it to minimize any disturbances. Suddenly, Fel communicates telepathically, expressing annoyance at being labeled a great wolf. The guard warns Mokauda that he'll be held responsible for any trouble Fel may cause within the town. Recognizing the need for moving around, Mokauda suggests they need a map. He visits a bustling tavern filled with rowdy adventurers and approaches a group to inquire about obtaining a map. Mokauda generously orders drinks for the table, sparking a friendly conversation. They provide information about the various kingdoms and upon learning that Mokauda lacks a map, reveal they possess one passed down by a veteran adventurer. Since they've already memorized it, they offer to sell it to him for one gold coin. Mokauda readily agrees to the deal, and they part ways amicably. After the men leave, the other adventurers burst into laughter, exposing his unfortunate scam with a map, which turns out to be a common item worth merely one silver at the guild. Despite the setback, Fel offers comforting words, assuring him that they will find ways to earn more money. Mokauda, unfazed by the incident, decides to set a course towards the eastern country by the sea. Fall, however, is more intrigued by the prospect of savoring the seafood they can obtain along the way. Meanwhile, the wind goddess, Nenrur, observes them from afar, especially curious about Mokauda, who has managed to form a contract with Fall. Seeing the delightful sweets they enjoy, she can't resist the temptation to taste them herself. However, she understands she can't directly interfere in their world. However, the desire takes over her, driving her to the brink of madness. As Mokota and Fall journey through the forest, they suddenly come to a halt. Fall appears to be covered in injuries, which puzzles Mokota. Fall explains that his injuries are a result of his rapid dash through the forest. Mokata wonders if they have finally reached the sea, but Fall corrects him, revealing they are at a lake because he has a strong craving for fish. Mokata ponders how to catch fish without a rod, and to his amazement, Fall uses his lightning magic on the lake, causing all the fish to float to the surface. Mokata begins collecting the fish, including some trout, and questions whether they taste similar to Earth's fish. Fall urges him to gather the pink fish, claiming it tingles his tongue. Suspicious of the color, Mokauda appraises it and discovers it is a poisonous fish. He immediately returns it to the lake, unwilling to mix poison with his cooking. Fall agrees and then helps Mokauda light a fire. 
As he gathers other ingredients, Fall persistently asks him to buy meat, but Mokuda repeatedly declines. Mokuda starts preparing the fish, remembering a cooking series he has watched on Earth. He skillfully guts and cleans the fish, then skewers them and seasons them with salt before placing them over the fire to grill. His culinary efforts give a variety of delicious fish dishes and when both of them taste and love. Fall enthusiastically devours the food, while Mokauda even cracks open a beer to complement the fish. They end up completely full. Mokauda is taken aback when he suddenly encounters a blue slime. Fall reassures him, explaining that it is quite weak. Curious, Mokauda pokes the slime, finding it just like jelly, and the slime playfully high-fives him. Curious, he checks its stats and realizes it's quite weak, having only come into existence three days ago. The slime bobs up and down, and Mokota wonders if it's hungry. Unfortunately, he's run out of food. The slime ends up eating a bottle, surprising Mokota by revealing that slimes can even consume rocks. It proceeds to munch on other trash, but when it grabs a frying pan, Mokota intervenes. However, he's happy that slime cleaned up his garbage and seems to light it with the praise he offers. Mokota starts petting it, and Fall tells him it has become his familiar. Mokawa is puzzled because he didn't make any special contract, but Fall explains that accepting Slime's feelings was enough. When he checks its status, it indeed shows a familiar bond. Fall encourages him to give it a name, and Mokota chooses Sui. A few days later, Mokota attempts to learn Earth magic, but struggles to even launch a pebble. Fall suggests gaining more practical experience, but Mokota is still shaken from being chased by goblins and refuses. Taking a break, Mokota notices that Sui is growing and is already at level 8. He wonders if consuming items from the other world offers benefits similar to food. Fall starts feeling hungry again, so Mokota prepares an orc meat bowl for him, even making a bowl for Sui. They all enjoy their dinner, with Sui helping to clean the dishes by dissolving the food scraps, earning Mokota's gratitude. Mokauda then decides to have dessert to accompany Sui's first meal, serving them doreaki, a pastry with sweet red bean filling. Sui seems to relish it, and Mokuda is pleased. In the morning, Fall receives a message from the goddess. When Mokauda wakes up, he shares the message, informing him that the wind goddess Nenrud is willing to bless him under certain conditions. To receive her blessing, Mokauda must pray and offer sweets from the other world once a week. Nenra can only grant a minor blessing, but it will render him immune to all status ailments and enhance his magic. Mokauda eagerly accepts the offer. He wonders how to pray and make offerings and Fall explains that even a simple rock on the ground can serve as an altar as long as the feelings are sincere. For the first offering, Fall requests dorayaki, along with cream and melon bread. Mokauda is surprised by the specific demands but goes on to prepare and offer them to the goddess. Meanwhile, Nenmer, after getting the blessing, grabs the sweets and is amazed by their softness and sweetness. She quickly devours them but feels sad when they're gone. She tries Mokauda's coffee, finding that its bitterness complements the sweets perfectly. She wants more sweets but decides to savor them. However, in the end, she can't resist and devours them both. Thanks to Mokauda's training, he can now shoot larger stones with greater speed and force due to his blessing. Sui also reaches level 13, and Mokata wonders if Sui will evolve eventually. He continues practicing but gets tired when he runs out of mana. To recover, he eats some chocolate and shares some with Sui. When Fall comes back, who went to investigate something, he realizes they're eating without him. Mokata shows Fall the chocolate he ate to recover, and Fall suddenly claims to be tired from running. Mokata doesn't believe him, but Fall tells him he's tired from carrying Mokata every day, so he orders more chocolate for Fall. That's when Mokota receives a message from Nenruder, who calls it a divine message, but really just wants some chocolate. Mokota mentions that it hasn't been a week since his last offering, but Nenruder insists on it. Mokota reluctantly sends her the chocolate, and Phil suddenly decides that it's time to go. Upon Mokota asking if they're in a rush, Fel gives him a suspicious look. They end up at the entrance to a dungeon, confusing Mokota. Fel explains they're here to gain experience, just like when Mokota learns fire magic by fighting goblins. Hesitant, Mokota tries to sneak away, but Fel stops him. Looking at the dungeon, Mokota is terrified and wants to leave, however Fel assures him there are only weak monsters inside since he's explored it already. Mokota remains skeptical, but Fel insists on this method because Mokota's training hasn't given out significant results. He tells Mokota not to worry since he'll protect him with his barrier, but one day, he may not be there, so Mokota needs to learn to defend himself. Reluctantly agreeing, Mokota decides to prepare first. He creates a feast with various foods from his shop. 
Fel is curious about his preparations, and Mokuda explains that food from the other world gives temporary buffs, just like when Fel feels stronger after eating the steak. Since he doesn't know which foods boost which stats, he plans to eat a bit of everything and then share the leftovers with Fel and Sui. As they sit down to eat, he tries a bit of each dish and senses that his abilities are getting stronger. Sharing some food with Sui, he notices that Sui's stats also improve. When they wonder if the trash Sui eats has any benefits, Mokota reveals it actually helps Sui level up. After finishing their meal with dessert, they all feel quite full. Upon checking their stats, they see that all of them have increased by about 20%. They decide they're ready to continue their journey. However, Mokota still has some concerns. They start walking but not before Mokota reminds Fel to cast his protective barrier. As they move cautiously, Fel gives him a nudge, and he accidentally encounters a slime. He feels guilty about attacking it, but Sui comes to the rescue with a burst of acid. Fel praises Sui's attack, suggesting that Sui might be quite unique. As more slimes approach, Mokota uses his stone bullet spell to deal with one while Sui handles the other. Soon, they encounter horned rabbits and Fel warns him. Panicking, he swings his sword wildly, fending them off. Mokota wonders why they're facing constant attacks, unlike the outside world where monsters typically avoid Fel, who then explains that dungeons are different, the monsters inside are always hostile. On the next level, they face kobolds. Mokota uses his stone bullet, taking out two of them, Feeling proud, he wants to become even stronger. They reach the final floor, expecting around 10 cobalts, but to their surprise, there are more. Mokata wants to give up, but Fel convinces him that with Sui's help, they can prevail. Mokata doesn't believe it, but Sui gets him excited. Fel kicks him into action, and all the cobalts focus on him. Mokata feels terrified, but he's protected by Fel's barrier. Sui attacks with his acid, while Mokata uses his earth magic. They manage to eliminate most of the cobalts. The remaining ones flee, and the Cobalt King emerges. Mokawa is terrified as he dodges the King's attacks. He fires stone bullets, but they bounce off the King. Mokawa attempts a powerful spell, but it has little effect. Fel realizes his barrier might not be sufficient, urging Mokawa to avoid getting hit as the Cobalt King prepares for its next attack. Mokawa uses a powerful stone blast that hits the beast on its head. Even though it gets hurt, the beast stands up again. Mokata tries to attack but runs out of mana. The beast swings at him, but his barrier activates, surprising everyone. Fel had claimed that his barrier would never break against such a weak attack, so while the beast struggles with the barrier, Sui comes to the rescue, attacking it with acid and defeating the Cobalt King. The beast turns into a pile of goop, and Sui starts to glow. Mokata passes out, and Fel carries him out of the dungeon. When Mokata wakes up, he panics but soon realizes he's outside. Sui comforts him and explains that after defeating the king, he can now talk. He calls Mokota master, which Mokota finds even more adorable. Mokota then checks Sui's stats and sees that he has leveled up and gained the acid bullet skill. He also checks his own stats and finds that he has gained four levels and now has the earth magic skill. Fel returns and Mokota wonders where he had gone. Fel mentions that he had been passed out for a while and got hungry, so he went to find food. He asks for some food as a reward for helping Mokata learn earth magic. Although annoyed that Fel had lied about his barrier, Mokata agrees. He prepares a dish with eggs and leftover rock bird, which turns out to be delicious. Fel is amazed by the use of eggs, and Sui finds it delicious too. After their meal, Mokota asks if Phil has talked with Sui, who mentions that he has talked a lot with Uncle Phil while Mokata was asleep. Mokata laughs at Fel being called an uncle, and Fel gets mad, reminding Sui not to call him uncle. Mokata teases Fel, saying that compared to Sui, who was only two weeks old, he is definitely an uncle. Sui, despite Fel's protests, affectionately calls him uncle, and this makes Fel get mad at it. Sui starts crying, and Mokuta scolds Fel for being mean. Despite this, Fel reluctantly allows Sui to continue calling him uncle. As they journey together, Fel mentions that they pass through Warthros and Griffin territory. Most humans avoid these areas, but Fel insists on going straight through, which worries Mokota, who questions this choice, fearing they might get attacked, but Fel dismisses the threat. Mokota attempts to convince Fel to change their route, but Fel reveals that they're already in the Orthros territory. As they proceed, they hear the sounds of beasts in the forest and soon encounter a pack of Orthros, twin-headed wolves. Fel uses his intimidation skill to make the Orthros back off, but one of them still wants to fight. Fel notices that it's a young and reckless one, so he tells Mokota and Sui to step back. Mokota hides in a bush, and Fel tries to warn the beast, but it lunges at him. 
Fel swiftly used the skill to defeat the beast with a single slash, leaving the other Orthros terrified, and they flee. Mokaba is astounded by the power of Fel's attack and learns that it's a skill Fel invents 600 years ago. As Fel talks about it, Mokota notices his smug expression and wonders if he could also learn the skill. Mokaba acknowledges that it's unlikely since he lacks claws but compliments Fel's acid bullet skill. As they set up camp, Mokuda remains uneasy, but Fel reassures him that the Orthros have learned their lesson. Fel is more focused on their dinner plans, but Mokoda is still concerned, especially about whether he has set up their protective barrier correctly. Sui interrupts, expressing hunger, and Mokuda rushes to prepare a nice meal for him. Fel notices how differently Mokoda treats the two of them. While preparing dinner, Mokoda asks Fel how much longer it will take to cross the forest, to which Fel replies that they're halfway through. Mokoda is shocked to hear that they have another three weeks to go and worries that they might run out of meat. To solve the food issue, Mokauta decides to cook some black serpent, which he's heard tastes similar to chicken. He orders the necessary ingredients and removes the meat from the bones, finding it lean like chicken breasts. He cuts it up, marinates it in sugar and sake, creates a special chili sauce, and fries it all together to make his dish. Mukata hesitates at first, unsure about trying the dish. He pictures it as chicken, takes a bite, and discovers its deliciousness. Fell, captivated by the taste, eagerly snatches the dish from Mukata's hands, craving more. As they journey through the forest, Phil suddenly halts when he spots some rare healing mushrooms blowing in the breeze. Mukata decides to gather them, while Sui nibbles on a few. Mukata collects a bunch of these mushrooms, and then something extraordinary happens. Sui starts glowing, leaving Mukata concerned about his well-being. The glowing eventually subsides prompting Mokauda to use his appraisal skill to confirm that Sui has gained the ability to create healing potions. Fel recalls a time when he saw a slime turn into metal after consuming metal, and Mokauda can't contain his joy. He praises Sui and encourages him to try out his new skill. Sui conjures a healing potion from his hand, which Mokauda swiftly bottles. When Mokauda appraises the potion, it turns out to be of high quality. He wonders about its significance and learns that Sui can create three levels of potions for different healing needs. Fell, despite his long experience, has never encountered a slime with this ability, making Sui truly unique. Mokauda celebrates this discovery, and Sui eagerly embraces the praise. Their journey continues until they enter Griffin territory. Mokauda trembles with fear as a griffin lands nearby. To their surprise, the griffin shows respect and speaks. It requests a favor from Fell, a battle to prove itself as the group's leader. Fell accepts the challenge but warns that he won't hold back. Mokauta seeks cover and signals Phil not to kill the griffin. The intense battle commences with Phil charging at the griffin, landing a powerful kick. Feathers rain down as the griffin retaliates with an attack. Phil summons his wind magic, creating a colossal tornado that slices through the bird. Mokauta, recognizing Phil's efforts, urges him to stop. Phil ceases his magic, and Mokuda rushes to the heavily injured griffin's side. He calls for Sui and administers the healing potion, saving the griffin's life. Despite feeling defeated, the griffin has managed to inflict some damage on Phil. Reluctantly, Phil admits this fact. The griffin lets out a cry, and the rest of its flock joins, accepting it as their leader. As a token of gratitude, the griffin offers one of its feathers to Mokauda, ensuring that they will not harm his descendants. The griffins depart, and as night falls once again, they prepare to rest. After expending his energy in the battle, Phil craves a hearty serving of meat. However, Mokeda points out that he has meat aplenty every day. Undeterred, Mokauda decides to cook the remaining meat. He skillfully fries up some orc meat and Fel and Sui eagerly savor the meal. Mokauda, though initially hesitant due to the orc's appearance, concludes that it's simply pork and they all joyfully partake in their repast. Following their meal, Phil questions whether he has been making offerings to Nenri. Mokauda, on the other hand, appears to have forgotten. Fel reproaches him, and Lizzie Ninri urges Mukana to offer his prayers. However, Ninri scolds him for being tardy, asserting that she has been observant and knows he has merely forgotten. Her reprimand continues, but Makata implores for forgiveness, offering a tantalizing array of Western desserts. Ninri's mood undergoes an instant transformation as she salivates over the desserts, and she is captivated by the cake. She demands that Makata send her an equivalent amount next time. The group eventually emerges from the forest and approaches the kingdom of Leonard. He remarks that they need to reach the guild since they are running low on meat. Fel immediately expresses concern and begins searching for the road. Along the way, they stumble upon a distant caravan, and Fel notes that it is under attack by bandits. Mukana urges Fel to aid them, promising a special dinner. 
excited by the offer, Fell dashes off. At the caravan, the people are struggling against the bandits until Fell lets out a thunderous roar that freezes everyone in their tracks. He warns the assailants to surrender, and they all drop their weapons, subsequently getting captured. Lambert, the caravan owner, and Lars, the leader of the adventurer group, express their gratitude for Fell's assistance and are amazed to meet the person of whom rumors have spoken. Mokulla inquires about their destination, and Lambert reveals they are heading to the city of Carolina. Learning that Mokauda and his companions are new to the area, Lambert invites them to join their journey as it makes him feel safer. As Mikata joins the escort, he overhears the guards debating whether Fell is a Fenrir or a great wolf. Mokauda is taken aback by how widespread the rumors about Fell have become, but he discovers that the guilds have been sending letters about him using magical teleportation tools. Everyone seems fixated on Fell, while Mokauda is concerned about keeping his identity as a summon hero with item storage and shop skills concealed. He hopes that no one will make any attempts in this new kingdom. When the caravan halts for the night, Fell reminds Makata of the promised special dinner for saving the caravan. While the guards are busy selling jerky for their meals, Mokauda discovers the secluded spot. He has a craving for plenty of meat, but his constant requests are beginning to bore Makata. However, when Sui expresses his desire for some meat, Mokota gladly agrees. Although he has run out of steaks, he decides to combine all the remaining meat to fulfill his promise of a special dinner. Mokota goes all out with his seasoning, marinating the meat with his sauces, adding flour, and giving it a good shake to create a coating. He then fries it all up, resulting in a delightful fried chicken dish. Sui finds it amazing, with two distinct flavors, and even Fell seems to relish it. As Mikata continues cooking the remaining meat, the tantalizing aroma wafts through the caravan, drawing everyone's attention. Curious, they approach to see what he is cooking. Mikata offers them a taste, and the men instantly declare it to be the most delicious food they've ever had. Mokata keeps cooking and serving the food until he is utterly exhausted. The guards express their gratitude, but unfortunately, Mokata doesn't get a chance to eat anything himself. As night falls, the guards urge him to rest while they stand watch. The bandits curse at them, but Mokuta warns them not to attempt anything funny, threatening that Phil will deal with them. The terrified bandits don't dare to cause trouble. After a peaceful night, they finally arrive in Carolina Lambert. Lambert explains that it is the fifth largest city in the kingdom, and his family has been leather merchants there for generations. The bandits are handed over to the city knights, and Lars heads to the guild to submit his report. Mokuta also decides to visit the guild and promises to stop by Lambert's shop. However, when Mokata tries to re-register his card, he finds it has been deactivated because he hasn't completed the required number of quests in the last month. Mokata thinks back on all he has been through in the past month. The clerk explains that most people take as many missions as possible to quickly reach F rank since the time limit is extended to three months. Mokata decides to re-register and proudly mentions that he has gained a second familiar, showing off Sui. Unfortunately, the girl at the counter is unimpressed, and Mokota faces some laughter from other adventurers. Determined not to let it bother him, Mokota heads over to the guild butcher, but on the way, he encounters Lars and his group. Mokota explains that he is trying to sell some of the beasts they have caught, and Lars asks to have a look, curious to see what Phil has caused. Mokota agrees, and when he displays his haul, the group is shocked. Some of the monsters are completely unfamiliar to them. The butcher is thrilled to work with such high-class materials, boasting about his expertise in dissecting monsters. He skillfully removes the skin from a red serpent, mentioning how this meat is a rare treat for ordinary folks. Mokalba and Phil start daydreaming about the delectable taste, while Lars suddenly becomes curious about their last night's dinner. Mokalba reveals it was a feast of various meats, including rock bird, giant deer, and orc meat. The group realizes they had unknowingly enjoyed a high-quality meal, and they apologize to Mokauta for not recognizing it sooner. Mokauta graciously accepts their apologies, citing his abundance of such fare. Lars, who is well-known in the city, offers Mokauta his assistance and asks him to call if he ever needs anything. Later that night, Mokauta rests at an inn, contemplating the need to achieve an F rank to maintain access to the butcher. Uncertain about becoming an adventurer, he hears Nenri's voice, reminding him of more important duties. She has been patiently waiting for him. Mokauta checks his shop and selects various jellies and puddings, offering them to Nenri in gratitude for her blessings. Nenri is pleasantly surprised by the wobbly texture of the pudding. Her enjoyment of the dessert attracts the attention of other goddesses. The following day, Mokauta examines the guild's job board. Each job offers points based on its difficulty, with herb gathering granting 1 point and goblin hunting granting 3 points. He needs to accumulate 100 points to advance to the next rank. 
Fel suggests taking the goblin quest for faster leveling, but Mokota declines due to past goblin-related trauma. Fel is eager to reach the ocean for seafood delights, a craving he's had since their last fish feast. He asks Sui for his opinion, suggesting they could face goblins, which excites Sui. Mokota tries to persuade them to choose the safer herb collection option, but Sui insists he can make his own medicine and prefers combat. Reluctantly, Mokota agrees, opting for the goblin hunting mission. Entering the forest, their mission is to eliminate three goblins. They swiftly locate some goblins, and Sui dispatches them effortlessly with his acid bullets. To prove their success, Mokauta must collect the goblins' right ears, a task he struggles with despite his experience in monster cooking. Fel finds it odd, but Mokuda argues it's not the same. Mokauta's rant inadvertently attracts a horde of goblins, but Sui easily takes them down with his acid spray. They discover the goblin camp, and Mokuda believes they've done enough to complete the quest. However, Sui pleads to continue, Mokuda relents, and Fel persuades him to join. In the end, they eliminate all the goblins and Sui enthusiastically declares it was a lot of fun. Fel instructs Mikata to gather the ears of the defeated creatures, but Mikata hesitates. Nonetheless, Fel insists and drags him along. After collecting all the ears, Mukata is left emotionally shaken by the experience. Concerned about how to dispose of the bodies without attracting more monsters or the creation of a dungeon, Fel proposes burning them, but Mikata worries about starting a forest fire. In the end, Mukata turns to Sui for help, asking him to dissolve the bodies with his acid. Sui starts to tremble and grows to an enormous size. When Mikata returns to the guild, everyone is shocked at the number of goblins they defeat. He is summoned to meet the guild master, Willem, and starts to worry. They are introduced to Guild Master Willem, who confirms that they eradicate the entire goblin settlement. Mokawa admits to their actions, and Willem is impressed by Fel's strength. He discloses the true reason for summoning them, mentioning a message he receives from the royal palace. The message states that they can live freely in the country, relying on Fel in times of emergency. Mokawa celebrates their newfound freedom from the agendas of the nobles. Willem believes that just having a legendary beast in the country will deter neighboring nations. Mokawa expresses his desire to level up his guild rank, and Willem, as guild master, decides to promote him to a higher rank. Mukata is surprised by this offer. Willem mentions that it could be problematic if Fel's master holds a lower rank, and in exchange for the promotion, he has some requests. Initially, Mukata is hesitant about taking on regular work, but Willem reveals that he wants Fel's assistance in tackling some challenging A and S rank missions. Fel confidently accepts and Willem is delighted as there are usually no adventurers capable of handling such tasks. Willem assures that he informs other adventurers not to interfere with them and Nukana trusts him. Mukana then makes a special request, revealing a collection of high-ranked monsters he has been concealing. Willem and the Butcher are astonished by the monsters, with the Butcher never having seen a Chimera before. Mukana explains that he keeps them hidden to avoid causing a scene and expresses his intention to sell them to the guild. However, Willem informs him that the guild lacks the funds to purchase the Chimera from him. The Butcher is filled with excitement as he looks forward to collaborating with a blue ogre, and Mokuda is curious about what makes this ogre so special. The Butcher explains that it is a one-of-a-kind S-ranked monster. He also mentions the S-ranked Orc King, who possesses the unique ability to control all other orcs. Mokuda is astonished by the existence of these powerful S-ranked monsters, and Sui suddenly chimes in, expressing his desire to become strong like Fel. Mokuda begins to feel a bit anxious. Later that night, as they contemplate dinner, Mokuda feels they have been eating too much fried food lately, so he decides to prepare something more refreshing. He boils some rock bird knees, chops up his vegetables, and starts shredding the meat. Sui joins in to help, and together, they add a delicious sesame dressing. Although Fel has reservations about the vegetables, they end up thoroughly enjoying the meal, especially the sesame sauce. Mokauta realizes he forgets to cook rice, so he makes himself a sandwich instead, and both Sui and Fel ask for seconds. Fel rests after the meal, but Mokauta finds it a bit cramped as they are used to sleeping outdoors. To make it more comfortable, Mokauta brings out his futon and Fel quickly falls asleep. The next day, Mokota returns to the guild and is surprised to see his new card as silver, with a six-month time limit for his missions before deactivation. Willem pays Mokota, calculating the value of all the monsters he has sold. The Red Serpent is valued at 200 gold, and the Blue Ogre at 432 gold. Mokota is stunned by the total value, which amounts to over 1900 gold when factoring in the Goblin subjugation. Mokota begins to worry about potential threats coming after him. Willem then reveals two missions he needs help with, 
The first involves subduing a group of metal lizards with nearly impenetrable metallic skin. The second mission is to hunt a herd of bloody horned bulls causing trouble in a beginner hunting ground. Fell eagerly anticipates this mission, likening it to eating steak. As they leave the guild, Mokauta suggests they depart in the morning, but Fell is eager to have steak as soon as possible. Before leaving, Mokota stops by Lambert's store. He is interested in buying a new bag, and Lambert presents him with various options made from different materials. However, as the bag would be for carrying Sui, Mokota lets Sui choose the bag that suits him best. Sui opts for a red boar leather item, while Mokota selects a belt and considers acquiring some new shoes from a nearby shop. However, he decides not to draw too much attention to himself. The total cost amounts to 11 gold coins, but Lambert insists on offering it all for free as a gesture of gratitude for Makata's life-saving help and the delicious meal he had prepared. Okada thanks him, and Lambert inquires about the black serpent they had eaten, wondering if Makata still possesses its skin. Unfortunately, Makata had already sold it to the guild, which leaves Lambert disappointed. He mentions a shortage of serpent skin and expresses his dreams of obtaining some red serpent skin. Makata feels regretful about selling it all to the guild. Lambert suggests that if Makata acquires more serpent skin in the future, he should sell it directly to him, and Makata agrees. As they leave, the topic of serpent meat lingers, making Fel crave it. Mukata remembers its delicious taste and decides to cook some more. He begins marinating the meat and is prepared to offer Fel as much as she wants. When he starts frying it up, Tu and Fel complain that he is eating without them. Phil wants to join in, but Mokota decides to fry the meat for a second time. As they start eating, they find it even more delightful than before as the double frying has made it incredibly crispy. After finishing their meal, they are completely satiated. Mokata continues to cook, and Fell states that she can't eat any more. Mukana reveals that it is for himself, intending to store some for later. He enjoys a beer while Fell and Sui head to bed. Reflecting on his adventure, he feels fortunate to have such companions. Mokata and Fell proceed to the mountains, where they hear reports of lizards. Mokata wonders where they can be, but Fell detects their presence and identifies a cave in the mountains. Mokata wants to wait outside, but Fell charges in. Inside, they encounter only one lizard, which appears to be glowing. Mokata recognizes it as a mithril lizard and learns from Fell that it has likely evolved after consuming a significant amount of mithril. Fell explains that conventional magic won't work against it, as mithril has the property of nullifying magic. Mokata worries about the challenge, but Fell uses his lightning magic to swiftly defeat the lizard, explaining that his magic can't be nullified. Mokata pays his respects and starts storing it away. He also discovers a piece of mithril ore and begins to imagine the possibilities of crafting a mithril weapon. He collects some mithril, and Sui joins him in the endeavor. Mokata ponders his potential use, such as crafting armor that can neutralize magic or even utilizing the mithril lizard's skin. Suddenly, a forceful presence appears, crushing the mithril material while probably declaring that armor is unnecessary thanks to the superior barrier. This individual hungers for action and proposes continuing the guildmaster's second request. Bukana hesitates, but Fell's desire for succulent steaks prevails, and he drags Makai along. They reach a field inhabited by ferocious horned bulls, massive creatures akin to rhinos with foul tempers. Mukata, cautious of their imposing size, opts to remain on the sidelines. Unfazed, Fell boldly confronts the bulls, inciting Sui's envy, causing him to quickly join the fray. Mokauta, intrigued, approaches for a closer view, and in a sudden explosive burst of power, all the bulls are vanquished. Sui excitedly shares the details of the battle with Mokata, earning compliments from Fell for his performance. Mukata, astounded by the number of defeated bulls, begins collecting them, utilizing Sui's assistance as he divides into multiple slimes to aid in the task. Mokauta's mind races with thoughts of the delectable beef dishes he'll create back in town. Later, as they return to town, Mokauta and the butcher are startled by the sight of a metro lizard. Mokauta's apprehension deepens, but the butcher explains the rarity of an intact metro lizard, with the last recorded sighting dating back 400 years. Willem elaborates that this lizard signifies the discovery of a new mithril mine, a mineral so scarce that only three mines exist worldwide. The magnitude of this revelation leaves Mukata in awe. Willem suggests that the lizard be presented as an offering to the king and mentions that Mukata will be duly compensated for locating it and uncovering the mine, approximately 5,000 gold coins. The butcher, envious, watches this development. Mukata astonishes Willem and the butcher by revealing he has already completed the bull-related request. As he departs, he ponders the potential upheaval of his peaceful life. 
Fell reassures him, dismissing worries, and eagerly anticipates indulging in more steaks. Mokata starts preparing dinner, skillfully slicing and frying the steaks to a perfect medium rare. After resting them in foil, he serves the succulent steaks to Fell and Sway, whose taste buds dance with joy. Fell even compares the flavor to the weiju he once savored and requests more. Mokata obliges, enhancing the experience with his favorite steak sauce. They feast heartily until fully satisfied, and Fell contemplates his forgotten offerings to Nenri. He swiftly prepares an offering for Nenri, hearing her voice listing all the items she desires him to send. As he sends the offering, he suddenly hears the voices of the other goddesses. They express their discontent, feeling it's unfair that Nenri is receiving all the sweets for herself. Nenri argues that it's because she granted him her blessing, but the other goddesses offer to bless him as well. Despite Nenri's objections, Mukata mentions that he already has Nenri's blessing. However, they point out that Nenri's blessing is minor, and he lacks any affinity with one magic. They suggest that a more compatible blessing from the earth goddess Kisha or the fire goddess Agony would be much more suitable. Nenri interrupts, expressing concern that the god of creation may be upset with them for granting too many blessings. Nonetheless, the two goddesses believe that giving him minor blessings should be fine. Bukata wonders if anyone has ever received multiple blessings, but it appears to be unprecedented. Bukata attempts to use this as a reason to decline, but the two goddesses decide to bless him anyway. The water goddess Ruka feels left out because Kana doesn't have any affinity with water, making her blessing useless for him. She cries at the thought of being the only one without an offering from him. The other goddesses start to panic and urge Mukata to do something. Mukata is unsure of what to do, but upon seeing Sui, he asks Ruka to give her blessing to Sui instead. All the goddesses agree, and Ruka bestows her blessing upon Sui. Kisha notes that Ruka gave Sui a full blessing, but Ruka explains it's acceptable because she only gives her blessing once every 100 years, unlike the others who constantly give their blessings, angering the god of creation. Now that he is blessed by multiple goddesses, they demand his offerings. Mukata sends them an extra-large box of desserts, and they are overjoyed. Mukata checks his status and sees his new blessings, wondering what they do. Mokata explains that they protect him and boost his power, but Sui doesn't fully grasp it. Mukata decides to test it out. The next day, when Mokata tries his magic, he discovers that his power has dramatically increased, and he no longer feels exhausted after using his magic. He is pleased with the blessings and encourages Sui to try water magic to test her blessing. Sui begins using water magic to create a spinning orb of water, amazing Mukata. He wonders how far it can go and has Sui fire it at a tree, completely knocking it down. Sui also uses water as a blade, effortlessly cutting through the trees. Mokata believes in his own abilities but receives a caution not to instigate trouble in the town. Suddenly, Fel expresses a desire to spar with Sui, but Mokuta thinks it is premature. This leaves Fel disappointed, as he had hoped to find a formidable opponent. Mukata continues honing his magical skills, experimenting with his newly acquired stone wall spell. Meanwhile, Fel departs for a hunting expedition. By day's end, Mokuta eagerly unveils a house he has crafted using his earth magic, but the others aren't overly impressed. Fel returns with a black serpent, well aware of Mokuta's arrangement with Lambert. This makes Mokuta suspicious of Fel's intentions, but in reality, Fel simply yearns for a special dinner. When morning comes, Fel acknowledges the comfort of Mokauta's hut and wonders about their plans for the day, suggesting they can go hunting. Mokauta, however, favors returning to town to deliver the black serpent Fel has captured for Lambert. They make their way to the guild, where Mokauta visits the butcher to find that the bull meat has been prepared and he receives his payment for the portion he has sold. Mokauta also presents the black serpent to the butcher, who is astonished at how easily he has found another one. Mokata requested to be prepared, and Sui appears, wondering if it is lunchtime. Mukata eagerly prepares to cook, and Fel inquires about his enthusiasm. Mokata then reveals his new acquisition, a grinder that allows him to make minced meat. He begins grinding the bull meat, finding it amazing, and Fel joins in the effort. They end up grinding orc meat as well, mixing the meats together, adding eggs and onions, and shaping them into patties. These patties are also suitable for storing in his storage. Mokata proceeds to fry the patties, adding his special sauce, and Fel eagerly anticipates the meal. After enjoying their feast, Mokata cleans his shirt, but the soap doesn't perform well. This sparks an idea. He considers selling soap in his shop. Mokata purchases a quantity of shampoo and conditioner, transferring them into inconspicuous bottles. Sui plays in a tub of water, while Mokata contemplates how long it has been since he has taken a bath. He pays a visit to Lambert, who is taken aback by the black serpent's skin. 
Mokata reveals that he is also a merchant and asks Lambert to assess the potential value of his products. Lambert examines the soap, appreciating its fragrance. Mokata explains its enhanced effectiveness and also introduces the shampoo for hair washing and conditioner for silky smooth hair. Mokata becomes anxious at Lambert's reaction, but then Lambert bursts into tears, expressing his gratitude. Lambert's anniversary is approaching, and his wife has grown tired of his bags and accessories. He has been uncertain about what to get her, but he believes that these products would be perfect given her love for bathing. Upon hearing Mokauda's inquiry, Lambert is quick to confirm that he has a specially crafted bathtub designed for his wife. Mokauda is utterly astounded, envisioning the luxury of taking a bath. He eagerly requests a glimpse of this extraordinary bathtub, and Lambert graciously agrees. Mokava is left in awe upon seeing it, and Lambert elaborates on its exorbitant cost. This unique bathing apparatus requires a magical contraption to purify the water and the hiring of an earth magician to create it. The total expense runs well over several hundred gold coins, a clear testament to a prosperous merchant. Mokawa expresses his keen interest in acquiring a similar one, and Lambert generously offers to introduce him to the seller, much to Mokawa's delight. In a gesture of goodwill, Mokawa entrusts Lambert with some of his products to test, suggesting that he should personally experience their effects before presenting them to his wife. Lambert readily agrees, reluctant to subject his wife to untested goods. The following day, Mokawa returns, and Lambert greets him with enthusiasm. To Mokauta's surprise, Lambert's wife, Marie, rushes to meet him, introducing herself and displaying an eager curiosity about the products. After Lambert's bath, he emits a pleasant fragrance and his hair becomes incredibly soft, an immediate observation by Marie. Although Lambert is disheartened, thinking he has spoiled their anniversary gift, Marie reveals that she has also tried the products, with the shampoo providing superior hair cleansing and the conditioner leaving her hair exceptionally beautiful and smooth. This revelation leaves Mokauta thinking that they want to purchase more, but Lambert proposes an unexpected idea, selling the products in his shop. Mokauta is taken aback since he operates a leather store, but Mary is confident that the products will be a hit, asserting that it will be a missed opportunity for another merchant to sell them, as every woman in the city would desire them. She fervently urges Mokauta to sell the products to all the women, and he agrees, especially since he does not own a shop. Marie is overjoyed by this decision, anticipating her own personal supply. Upon his return, Mokota feels utterly exhausted after delivering a substantial quantity of products to the shop. Fel expresses a desire to search for a dungeon, but Mokuta declines as he has been summoned by the guildmaster. As Fel waits outside, Mokota overhears some adventurers discussing a stray wyvern, sparking concern about its potential danger. Upon meeting the guildmaster, Mokota is shocked to discover a towering stack of gold, with Willem explaining that he is being rewarded with a hopping 5,800 gold coins for discovering the mithril mine. Mokauta's thoughts instantly turn to purchasing his long-desired bathtub. However, an emergency interrupts his plans as a herd of wyverns approaches the area. The presence of an entire herd is surprising, and it appears that Mokauta's removal of the pack of bulls, which the wyverns typically prey upon, has led them to gather together. Several adventurers are injured, with some suffering from the deadly poison of the wyverns. The guild's supply of potions and antidotes is rapidly depleting, but Mokuda comes to the rescue with his high-grade potions. As Willem administers one of these potent potions, the injured man's wounds miraculously heal, poison included, leaving everyone astonished by its incredible effectiveness. After tending to the injured, Willem, the leader, calls upon all adventurers ranked and above to confront the wyverns. Among them, Mokota finds himself included in this mission. Willem gathers everyone, preparing for the impending battle. However, Fel intervenes, insisting that they will handle the wyverns without assistance. Mokota hesitates but is intrigued by Fel's proclamation that wyvern meat is a delectable treat. Fel declares that all the wyverns they vanquish will belong to them. Despite Willem's desire to assist, Fel insists that he will only hinder their efforts. They venture into the field and spot the wyverns in the distance. Mokauta recognizes the danger they pose, but Fel remains undaunted. He sees this as an opportunity to teach Sui, another member of their group, how to combat flying adversaries. Fel and Sui skillfully evade the wyvern's attacks. Fel advises Sui to aim for headshots, though hitting the wings is also effective. Sui shot misses the head but still manages to bring down the wyvern. Fel swiftly dispatches it. As they continue to battle the wyverns, Mokota observes from a safe distance, noticing how Sui is becoming increasingly like Fel, always eager for a fight. Suddenly, a wyvern approaches Mokota, but he is shielded by Fel's protective barrier. 
When the wyvern attempts to attack again, Sui intervenes, sending it tumbling away, and Fell deals the finishing blow. After defeating all the wyverns, Phil feels a bit hungry, so Mokota prepares to cook. He retrieves the patties he has prepared earlier, but Fell assumes they are having the same meal as before. However, Mokota dips them in egg and breadcrumbs before frying them, transforming the dish entirely. Fell is astonished by how different and delightful it tastes, thanks to the added crunch. Meanwhile, back at the guild, Will and the other adventurers begin to worry about Mokota's ability to handle the wyverns. Finally, Mokota returns and reports their successful victory. The adventurers are amazed and celebrate the accomplishment, which puzzles Mokota. Will explains that if the adventurers take on the wyverns, at least half of them will likely perish. Mokota feels guilty for taking so long but chooses not to mention their lunch break. However, Fell doesn't hesitate to reveal the reason for their delay, causing Mokota to blush. Mokota reports that they defeat 13 wyverns, sparking Willem's interest in purchasing their parts. Mokota is willing to sell everything except the meat. Unfortunately, the guild only has enough funds to buy back half of the wyverns. In the end, Mokota suddenly remembers he needs to offer his tribute to the goddesses. Just as he is about to send his offering, he receives a divine message from Agni, urging him to hurry. Mokawa explains his intention to send his offering and then receives a secret message from Nenri, reminding him that she is the first to bless him and expressing her desire to provide more sweets than the others. Kisha whispers a request to Makata, asking for the shampoo and hair products he sells. Ruka, curious about Makata's cooking skills, expresses her desire to try his other dishes. Mukana explains that he can't keep their requests a secret, as he plans to send everything at once. This annoys Agni, who joins in and asks Makata for some alcohol. Makata agrees, and the next day, Mukana and Fel attract more attention after defeating wyverns. Makata heads to a shop that catches his interest. He marvels at the various bathtubs available, each with unique materials and effects. Makata chooses a green bathtub, surprising the clerk with his quick decision, as it is quite expensive for an ordinary person. Makata assures the clerk he can pay and tells him not to worry about delivery, as he can store it himself. Mokata leaves the shop happily. Later, Mokuta and Fel decide to leave the city due to the attention they garner from the wyvern fight. Finding a peaceful spot, Fel goes hunting while Mokata uses his stonewall skill to create a private area. He sets up the tub, fills it with water with Sui's help, and heats it with his fireball before taking a bath. Mukana, too, enjoys a bath and then decides to cook some wyvern meat, intrigued by Fel's recommendation. He prepares a rich sauce and creates a special wyvern beef bowl. Noticing Fel's absence, Mukana decides to make stew with the extra time he has. He buys the ingredients, cuts them up, sears the meat, adds vegetables, water, and red wine, and leaves it to simmer. Sui mentions Fel's return, but as they wait, a dinosaur suddenly appears, shocking Mokauda. Fel explains that he is disappointed with the wyverns and has gone hunting, encountering an earth dragon. Mokauda can't believe his eyes, unsure of what to do with a dragon, but Fel thinks it will be a delicious meal. Mokauda can't help but remember the exceptionally rare monsters he has hunted but can't sell. He believes a dragon will fit the bill, but Fel is convinced it will taste great. Mokauda expresses concerns, but Fel suggests seeking help from the guild to sell it. Mokauda thinks this might work. Fel notices the stew Mokauda has made and gets excited, but Mokuda stops him, saying he is dirty from his fight. Fel feels a bit offended and tells him to take a bath before dinner. Fel notices some grooming tools in the shop, but Mokota clarifies he isn't a dog. Mokawada helps him untangle his fur with a brush and splashes him with water. Fel is surprised and wonders if Shui can use water magic. Mokawada explains it won't be hot enough. Mokawada then has an idea and turns Sui into a shower with hot water. Fel gets completely drenched and Mokuda shampoos him. Afterward, Mokota tries to dry him, but Fel uses his fire magic and wind to dry himself off. Mokata compliments his appearance, and Fel insists it is time for dinner. They begin with special beef bowls, which Fel finds amazing. Mokata is surprised that wyvern tastes similar to Weiju. As they eat, Mokata tells Fel he needs regular baths. Fel isn't thrilled, but Mokota uses Sui to convey that he looks better now. So Fel agrees. When they try the wyvern stew, Fel can't believe how good it is. He looks forward to what Mokata will make in the future. Back at the guild, Willem mentions it is impossible to resell the dragon. The butcher explains every part of the dragon is too valuable. Fel just wants to see it, but Mokuta says it isn't that simple. However, Willem thinks a certain dragon expert might help, and Mokuta and Fel are excited. Willem points to another city near the sea, which excites Fel, who has a goal to eat sea monsters. Willem and the butcher laugh but know they'll do just that. 
Mokauta says farewell to the people they have met and set off on their next adventure. And with this our story for today ends, if you want us to recap your favorite Anon comment down below and we will surely give them to you.